Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, me and uh, my colleagues at uh, COFAS uh, for our webinar on March 29th. Uh, very good to have you with us uh, on a Monday afternoon, and thank you for joining. So today we will um, do a uh, webinar on risk management in the changing landscape. So ultimately, uh, I will uh, introduce you to Hans Mayer, who's our Director of Information Claims and Collections, and he will be taking us through uh, information, how we're processing that, using that, what we've had to do to invest in more intelligence uh, over, the, over the coming, uh, over the last year and uh, for the future. Then I shall introduce you to uh, John Nicholas, our Underwriting Director. So looking at post-pandemic, how we're assessing information and how we're underwriting risk uh, now and in the future. And I'm pleased to uh, have with us uh, the City Sacratidis, a uh, partner at one of our legal partners, Crowell and Mooring, who will be joining us uh, to discuss Brexit. Is it over? A uh, big question mark there. Obviously, a lot has changed in the landscape since we hosted our last event in November. The pandemic, unfortunately, is still with us and still giving uh, the economy many challenges. Uh, both now and to come, but Brexit transition ended and, and really did it end. Um, so Vasilis uh, will be taking us through uh, a number of uh, steps there. And uh, obviously, if you want to ask some questions, uh, we'll be gathering those up for a Q&A uh, towards the end. So thank you very much again for uh, attending. And uh, without further ado, I will hand you over to Hans Mayer, who will start to uh, present on uh, meeting our information needs going forward. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining this. Um, basically, for me, I will be looking at how we've adapted to meet our information needs. If we can just have the first slide up, please. One of the big things that has changed, of course, is the corporate insolvency and the governance bill. I'm not going to go into all of these details, but for me, the main one uh, is, of course, the meeting and filing requirements. This was allowing companies greater flexibility and extra time to allow them to file information. Everybody assuming that under the pandemic, there would be uh, more working from home, therefore less office time, therefore less information access and therefore less filing. The other uh, changes, the moratorium, the restructuring, the prohibition of termination clauses, wrongful trading and all of those and the dem statute demands and winding up notices. All of those are still in effect. Uh, some of them have now been extended beyond the 30th of June. Actually, this week they've been ex extended now to September, um, but some of these are now going to expire. But meetings and filing requirements are still ongoing. If I can have the next slide, please. But what have we seen? Uh, we've seen a massive increase in the new businesses. I mean, an extra 84,000 businesses have been set up in 2020, which is effectively a 12% increase on the previous year. Uh, between Ju June and August, we saw nearly 60,000 new companies. Some of the big winners there on the new companies were unsurprisingly retailers of medical goods. We've also had an increase in clothing. So nearly 80% of the businesses increase in, in clothing. We've also had losers in the new businesses. We've had, uh, an unsurprisingly again, aircraft repair and maintenance, a drop of 44% uh, increase, uh, sorry, drop in IT consultancies as well. Uh, but the reality is that many of these businesses have been created by those who've lost their jobs. So SMEs are not creating additional employment. These are one man bands. Large of these have been opened as a consequence of the Corona backup and the, the bounce back loans that have been set up by the government. Um, still, there are more accounts being opened now than we had six months ago after the start of these schemes. They're still growing in the number of businesses. If I can have the next slide, please. With this comes, of course, lack of data. Uh, not only have the filing requirements given more flexibility, they've been relaxed. And with that, there have been extended deadlines given as well. And all of these are temporary measures, but the businesses that will still need to apply for these um, uh, filing deadlines, uh, they have been changed. And you can see here PLCs have exchanged from six to nine months and P, uh, private limited uh, private companies and LLPs have changed from nine months now to 12 months. 
So all of that means that information is now uh, late, uh, is not readily accessible. And of course, there is a, a big question marks of how many of these new companies have also been created legitimately, you know, targeting the bounce back loan schemes, which is offered anything up to £50,000 in interest free for a year. Replay, repayment plans of these are over 10 years. Pay as you grow schemes have been implemented as well as payment holidays for these schemes. Now the next slide, please. So with this information, there's also misleading information. As mentioned, uh, we have new businesses, so there's not much filing information, but what we're also seeing that as a result of the uh, bounce back loans and, and the other C-bills, we've got credit turnovers and credit accounts have been boosted with the government support. Uh, the outgoings on these accounts is less. So we're seeing the businesses holding on to surplus cash. We see also that average current balances are much higher than they were at the start of the year. The financial support schemes have boosted basically these current accounts. We've also seen the delinquency rates increasing at the beginning of the summer. Subsequently, these have sort of decreased and plateaued. Payment holidays and additional support have also suppressed any of these spikes in delinquency rates. And all of this is showing misleading information on the liquidity of business. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And this sort of leads to what, what are we doing to combat this lack of data? We're looking out for the changes in trade credit payments, I already mentioned delinquency, so we're watching that through our collections and our claims team. We're also increasing our activities during the coronavirus. We issued questionnaires to try and get more information directly from the buyers. We've also increased our buyer interviews. We did nearly 5,000 in the space of the last 12 months. We've also introduced new alerts based on financial analysis. We're also looking going forward to open up a web form online, allowing for buyers to supply us with information readily available so that we can act more on management accounts than on physical information that's available at company's house. We're also increasing our back office support to gather all this information and to, and to also to trawl through the internet to looking for more information and also allowing us to try and uh, build up more of this information. It's basically trying to enrich our own data. And this information is also available to our client base. Um, with that, I want to keep it short. I will hand you over to John. Thank you, Hans, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, so I was just going to take you through a couple of slides on uh, the uh, risk underwriting perspective. But just before that, I'll just start with an update of uh, COFAS's projections for global GDP growth. So if we turn to this first slide. Um, so look, so the economic recovery is now expected to be stronger than uh, say predicted three months ago. Uh, COFAS is now forecasting 5.1% uh, growth for 2021, that's globally, uh, which means actually the global economy will surpass its pre-pandemic size um, by the end of uh, the end of this year. And this outlook is actually consistent with other views. For example, Fitch have uh, recently projected 2.5% uh, net growth in GB GBP between 2020 and 2021. So the main the main driver. Uh, for this is the the 1.9 trillion dollar uh, fiscal stimulus package that the US uh, obviously announced, but most other G20 countries have uh, announced uh, various forms of continued government support. Now, of course, including including the UK, um, but but equally uh, the rollout of the vaccination programs is going to be another encouraging factor. So this 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 unprecedented uh, level of state intervention um, has undoubtedly mitigated the negative consequences of the recession, and this is reflected in the low levels of corporate uh, insolvencies and, and claims that uh, you know, and on the claim side, which COFAS and uh, most other insurers have uh, have witnessed. However, we can realistically expect some reversal of these trends, uh, particularly in the more sensitive sectors, uh, and particularly once the government support mechanisms are uh, are progressively removed. So if we can turn to the next slide, please. So, I mean, focusing now a little bit more on, on the UK, um, 
as we progressively exit the latest lockdown, there there is cause for cautious optimism. There's a number of positives. Um, while you know, while the momentum of vaccine rollout and the potential emergence of further infection spikes could yet still have a, an influence on the rate of that recovery, but at least at least we do now have a, a better visibility of the the roadmap back to normality. Um, additionally, I mean, the other factor obviously been impacting the uh, the UK particularly is uh, with the Brexit saga largely over. Um, consumers, businesses should be more confident when considering, you know, their future commitments, investment decisions by businesses, for example. But I think, you know, um, as, as, as no doubt a lot of you are aware, although there was uh, theoretically this free free trade agreement and this was achieved with the EU, the transition is uh, proving more difficult for, for, for many businesses, particularly uh, small, medium enterprises that have been disproportionately impacted by the burden of the additional red tape and costs now associated with uh, exporting to the EU. I mean, for example, um, exports of food and drink to the EU fell by 75% um, in January 2021 compared with the, the previous January. So although the impacts of COVID and stockpiling ahead, ahead of the transition period were contributing factors, um, much of this is also due to these uh, non-tariff uh, barriers uh, faced by U UK exporters. And of course, the these constraints are also having a negative uh, uh, a negative uh, direct impact on uh, other sectors, such as the road haulage sector, which um, we've become aware of, of, of faced uh, with rising costs due to customs delays and, uh, and larger number of uh, empty vehicles returning to the continent. I think yeah, more broadly, and we, we touched on this in the uh, our last w webinar uh, back in November. This this growth of zombie companies, and again, so you know, just thinking more broadly, there is, has been a really significant increase in the number of zombies uh, that arose that have arisen during the uh, the pandemic. Um, of course, these are not not just in the obvious sensitive sectors like travel, hospitality, leisure, but there are there is a, a number of uh, you know wider sectors that uh, face. Uh, or companies within them that face an uncertain short term future. So uh, around about one and a half million businesses have been obliged to take out uh, state back loans, which has increased their financial leverage, uh, yet, yet being faced with months of limited activity or in some cases no activity. So although the repayment of the debt can now be extended up to 10 years, uh, at best this may only prolong the existence of, uh, of some businesses which actually have no long-term prospects and, and no ability to invest. And even the recently announced um, the new recovery loan scheme, um, which is sort of replacing effectively the, the business interruption loans, this is actually this will uh, be more expensive because it's risk-based interest rates and they'll be for companies who are you know, basically obliged to borrow yet further. So just turning to uh, the next slide, please. So, um, I mean, in summary, the, the, the conclusion of Brexit and this roadmap out of lockdown have, have removed some of the uncertainties that have made actually assessing credit risk uh, rather more complex in, in recent times. Um, Hans has already highlighted the, um, the reliance on newly fired accounts, and this can result in misinformed underwriting decisions if we just took them in isolation, which either could be too positive or, or too, ne too negative indeed. So, um, really, uh, the uh, having the up-to-date information is, uh, is is absolutely critical. So so underwriters can best judge the the current financial health of a buyer, uh, and also to assess its uh, future prospects with um, with with adequate consideration to the uh, evolving macro uh, environment as well. And so you know on the on sort of final point, I think it's uh, worth just also mentioning the uh, you know the government scheme. So while so while the HMG scheme has provided a useful backstop uh, to support our, if you like, our conventional underwriting approach. Uh, COFAS's ethos uh, has always been and remains to support clients with sustainable credit limits uh, based on the, the best risk intelligence. So while normal risk monitoring activity is continuing, um, there are actually you know, no temporary limits that are due to expire or coincide with the cessation of the scheme and uh, equally no risk actions plans. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think so in, in summary, um, we need to proceed with caution. There are definitely uh, a lot of risks. There's still some, uh, uh, you know, uh, twists and turns, shall we say, that we, we can expect uh, th throughout the remainder of this year. 
Um, but yeah, we 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 we're here to uh, remain supportive, and uh, with the with the work that's going on within Hans's team in building our proprietary level of uh, information on the, on the bio risks, uh, I think we're well placed to make sure that we can keep tabs accurately on the, on the development of those buyers. So um, please feel free to uh, message with any questions, and I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Other than that, I'll uh, hand over now to uh, to Vasily. Thank you very much, John. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a lawyer, I'm a trade lawyer based in Brussels. Uh, I've been dealing with uh, customs and trade almost all my life. So um, I'm in the receiving end of uh, client queries um, on Brexit, which, um, if you will, is also a barometer of, of, of the situation on the market. Um, so I'm happy to convey to you our experiences and what we think are the key uh, focus areas uh, for operators. Next slide, please. So these are the main chapters of, uh, I mean, well, a very short pr presentation anyway. Um, so first of all, there's White Smoke, uh, the TCA, the Trade Cooperation Agreement was born. And we're going to look at um, some key customs compliance issues post-Brexit. In particular, um, uh, I'm going to address preferential and preferential origin and accumulation of origin, which are um, uh, very tricky uh, areas. And then a couple of words about what's the future of trade defense uh, in the UK. Next slide, please. So, uh, handshake here, uh, white smoke, that's great news actually. It would have been terrible if an agreement wouldn't have been reached. Um, so in a way, the end of uncertainty for businesses, which lasted for many years, uh, is over. But uh, new uncertainties emerge as to how the TCA uh, should be implemented uh, as smoothly as possible. Um, it's a quite comprehensive uh, agreement. Uh, it couldn't be otherwise for two parties who have been in the same well, in the same club is an understatement, in the same uh, uh, customs territory uh, and um, working together in areas of law that regulate uh, basically all aspects of life for so many decades. So it's not easy uh, uh, <clears throat> to part ways and we shall see a couple of uh, uh, issues why. So that presentation will focus on trading goods, not in, not in services because we, we don't have much time and I think that's where we see the first hiccups. Next slide, please. So, um, let's start with the basics. Um, UK tariff schedule. Um, that tariff schedule is almost the same than that of the EU 28 before Brexit, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and uh, the difference is right now, uh, are mainly focused on uh, differences in uh, the duty rates as the UK uh, decided to deviate uh, from its previous tariff schedule where, when it was part of the EU, uh, but also from the fact that the UK focuses more on the harmonized system and the TCA also speaks about uh, uh, harmonizing the tariff schedules at six digit level. The harmonized system is the first six digits of a customs code. So going forward, um, the remaining two digits to reach an eight-digit customs code or even 10 digits to reach the uh, EU tariff code uh, will deviate and uh, you need to pay uh, particular attention when classifying goods uh, under the new schedule. Um, second bullet point, careful with preferential and preferential origin. This is actually, this could turn mind-boggling. Um, the TCA provides for benefits in trade, which are always linked to uh, origin. So for goods to cross the borders without issues, without tariffs, and um, well, on most occasions without licensing and other procedures and quotas, um, they have to acquire UK origin. How to acquire preferential, uh, uh, and that UK origin is preferential because we have preferential trade agreement. Um, here, uh, you really need to spend time uh, if you're a manufacturer or a trader uh, to get things right. 
third bullet point accumulation of origin um, is potentially an issue in complex supply chains. What is accumulation of origin for those who never dealt with it? When you have a preferential trade agreement, um, to reach preferential origin, you have uh, usually a higher bar than uh, the origin rules applicable to non-preferential uh, trading partners. Um, and why is that? Uh, to make sure that uh, uh, preferential origin is achieved and uh, no door is left open or even ajar to circumventing the preferential rules. Now, accumulation of origin is a principle whereby um, when you have parties A and B, let's say the UK and the EU, uh, that have uh, an FTA, um, when a product is manufactured or assembled or processed uh, in one of the two, in the territory of one of the two parties, and that party uses products <clears throat> originating in the other party to the agreement, then these products, which should normally be considered as non-originating non um, uh, at the side of the manufacturing party, are considered as originating. So this means that if I produce a product in the EU, which incorporates EU and UK originating products, then all of those are considered to be of EU origin, thereby facilitating uh, acquiring origin in, in, in our bilateral trade. Now, that principle also applies with any other country with which the EU and the UK also have preferential trade agreements. The problem starts uh, 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 from the fact that the EU has preferential trade agreements with a different list of countries than those um, uh, with which the UK has preferential trade agreements. So you have complex supply chains, for example, involving countries like bringing material from Korea, uh, from Japan, from Canada, from any country where the EU has a preferential agreement. But the UK has not perhaps reached yet, concluded negotiations. Then for these countries, um, the accumulation of origin rules do not, uh, uh, do not play, do not enter into play. So be particularly careful with your origin status of your products, uh, in particular when you import many raw materials from third countries and you export to several other countries, including the EU. Um, on trade sanctions and export controls, um, the regimes are quite similar, but now the authorities are different. So uh, you need to turn to, you, to the UK authorities for the respective national rules as from January 1st. Um, then um, facilitating how, how can you navigate uh, faster? If you haven't done it, then you need to get authorized economic operator status, AEO status, which uh, greatly uh, accelerates and facilitates uh, trade. Now, to achieve all of that, it's, it would be very useful to run a trade risk assessment audit. Check what is your um, uh, schedule of classification of goods, of inputs, where do you import from, where do you export, what customs procedures you need to use, are you using any special customs procedures uh, like inward processing or any other bonded operation. Um, all of these you need to reassess because the rules have changed and you don't want to get uh, uh, into trouble. Um, and last slide, yeah, make sure you, you take well-informed decisions to avoid such trouble. Next slide, please. Now we have seen these pictures uh, and we have seen a slump in January of 40% uh, in trading goods, uh, actually in exports from the UK to the EU. Um, and of course, there's a lot of hype. I think personally that uh, a slump in the first month um, is probably justified by a number of uh, factors. First of all, uh, by the time the transition period ended, uh, there was a new strain of COVID-19 discovered that has complicated a lot um, the mobility uh, of, of people and goods uh, and even the lorry drivers having to take tests and what else have you. Um, but I think that, uh, and, and of course, the intense stockpiling in December uh, before Brexit uh, 
has brought some trade flows uh, ahead of the Brexit deadline. So perhaps the January picture is a bit artificial. Um, but the truth is that uh, companies are uh, obliged now to navigate in a totally new environment that they have to adjust. Hence the importance of um, getting well educated, um, re-streamline your, your supply chains, uh, uh, get familiar with the TCA rules on origin, uh, make sure you start navigating more smoothly um, than in the beginning. And obviously, the, the biggest onus is on uh, uh, SMEs, on small and medium-sized companies that don't have large uh, compliance departments and uh, we're not ready for this. Um, one more note here. One thing is to do uh, uh, a preferential trade agreement with a trading partner with whom you have 5% uh, uh, of your total trade. And another thing is to do an agreement with the EU where 50% of uh, the UK's uh, trade depends on, on, on the EU. So it, it is expected that in the beginning there would be uh, bottlenecks and, and difficulties. Uh, next slide, please. So the real issues uh, are the following. Uh, in trading goods, uh, all the procedures and the origin rules technical standards. What do you do with the long-term contracts? Um, what happens, uh, what, what are the consequences of the UK exiting existing EU trade agreements? What are the consequences on origin rules, um, on supply chain? How can you avoid disruptions? Do you need to shift to alternative suppliers and customers? Um, I mean, all these are very valid questions. And I can tell you that from from what we see from our clients, many of them are, are, are willing to take quite brave decisions um, to, to, to facilitate uh, their operation in, in these respects. Um, then other issues are security and data privacy rules, um, where these didn't really exist before, now they do because uh, the UK is the third country um, when looked at uh, from the EU perspective and uh, vice versa. And then last but not least, uh, dispute settlement. Um, what do you do if you have a dispute? Uh, where do you go? Uh, and whom do you fight against? Um, I would add to those that you need to be very careful and watch out for special custom procedures. Um, you need to use inward processing. You need to use duty drawback. Uh, in terms of refunds of the excise duties of, on, on the raw materials you import, um, get the proper licenses from HMRC, uh, apply them properly, and always make sure uh, that you give particular attention, pay particular attention to origin. Um, again, as a general uh, uh, advice is, um, I would say, watch out for previously given situations. Uh, which, uh, you know, at the EU28, which may not be given at all uh, post-Brexit. And uh, to recap, these concern classification of customs, uh, special customs regimes, like inward processing, uh, uh, duty drawback, out uh, outward processing, um, labeling requirements in particular for foods and drinks. Um, and labeling here is not just what you put on the label. Uh, what you put on the label also have substance. You need to declare an importer in the EU. There are SMEs who don't want to do that uh, or cannot do that, or they don't want to invest in a subsidiary in the EU to do this job. So labeling, very important. Um, and then, of course, there are uh, all sorts of uh, technical barriers to trade. Uh, sanitary, phytosanitary controls and technical barrier to trade. Uh, um, under the TCA, there are certain chapters there on motor vehicles, uh, medicinal products, chemicals, organic products, wine, and a few annexes left blank uh, to be filled in uh, by the two parties to the TCA uh, respective reports as time uh, goes by. So um, technical barriers to trade are bound to, first of all, um, uh, increase uh, as time goes by, uh, which is the bad news. The good news is that probably get more streamlined uh, 
uh, as, as as the practice of, of, of trade uh, moves on and people get used to it and so are authorities. Next slide, please. So, preferential and non-preferential origin. In, in the picture you see, um, uh, that's a picture of uh, cargo flights around the world. So that's how supply chains look like in a globalized world. Um, you may imagine that, that that kind of a web requires um, those of you in particular who have complex supply chains to uh, set uh, everything down to ground zero and start redesigning, reassessing, uh, questioning what you're doing, make sure that you're compliant uh, and try to de bottleneck your supply chain uh, uh, to the extent possible. Next slide, please. So a few words about uh, trade defense um, between a rock and a hard place. Because, why? Because the UK, while uh, it was a, a, an EU member state, uh, was always um, in favor of liberalism. So the UK always voted against anti-dumping duties. Um, when it decided to leave, uh, it was faced with market realities and had to mitigate a little bit this, I would say, ideological approach, um, and now uh, starts protecting its own businesses, um, its own industries. So um, the UK is now uh, carrying out uh, transition reviews to carry over existing um, EU anti-dumping and uh, uh, countervailing and safeguard measures, but uh, it will only protect those UK markets that, that have at least 5% market share in the UK. Um, another issue that I, I think will start emerging, if not already, is that the Trade Remedy Authority in the UK had no experience in conducting investigations themselves. So mistakes, imprecisions, uh, issues are unavoidable. Uh, therefore, beware and uh, control what they're doing if you're involved in any of these, of these procedures. And as, as, as a last note, uh, bear in mind you can use trade defense both as an offensive and defensive uh, tool um, when you suffer uh, uh, injury from uh, unfairly priced uh, imports, then you can complain and use it as an offensive tool, while if you're targeted by an investigation, you can defend yourself and uh, that's a powerful defensive tool as well. Um, there you go. Um, last slide, please. So how to navigate, get educated, read carefully the TRA, work with your specialized counsel, with your accountants, with your trade uh, compliance uh, officers and specialists, review your operations to make sure that, uh, that you're compliant, that's one thing, but secondly also that you streamline your operations to the extent possible and avoid bottlenecks and other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vasily and uh, Hans and John. Um, obviously, we'll get some questions coming through, but Vasily, if I could just ask you uh, a couple of questions. Um, so I, I think it's clear that Brexit isn't finished uh, ultimately, and um, that, that there's quite a bit of sort of water to go under the bridge, I'm sure. Do you think this, you know, getting to some kind of normalised trade is going to take months, years even, um, you know, before we find a you know, in, into a sort of a new rhythm? Um, that's a good question. It's a crystal ball question. I think that certain aspects like bureaucracy um, at customs, uh, these things should disappear within months, not years. Now, uh, I can't tell what's going to happen with um, more sensitive areas like perishable goods, uh, uh, food and beverage. Um, whether also, um, I don't know which way the UK government uh, wants to go going forward. If, they, um, if the UK decides to converge from a regulatory viewpoint, for example, with the US, in the context of a, a free trade agreement with the US, then that means that it will diverge necessarily from the EU. Um, so it's hard to tell. I think that Brexit after so many decades of relationship, it's going to be a dynamic uh, project going forward. Um, 
And I think that we're going to be pleasantly and unpleasantly uh, surprised, uh, depending on the area. For, for, for the moment, for example, food and beverage seems to be a disaster. Um, there was 75% uh, a reduction in volume of trade in January. Uh, I mean, that should balance out, ultimately. Um, uh, controls, customs controls, uh, knowledge of manufacturers, of end users, um, that things should 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 get streamlined. I mean, I don't see a reason why uh, we don't have such issues with other countries when we import into the EU, and why we will continue having such issues going forward with the UK. Um, I also believe it's very natural, but in the beginning uh, there's havoc. Uh, companies don't know how to be compliant. Uh, customs officers are doing things for the, for for the first time. Um, I have to tell you, I have seen very absurd situations uh, raised by our clients, customs uh, officers claiming in the EU, for example, that origin is UK, other customs offices claiming that it is not, because uh, as you may know, that customs laws, uh, I mean, the, the, the code, the customs main customs code is one for the EU, but the implementing legislations and uh, the, the, the administrative practice are not common, they're not harmonized. So imagine situations where Hamburg tells you one thing, but Antwerp tells you another. Um, so such phenomena will continue. I Thank don't you. think that the UK and the EU will ever really uh, divorce. Yeah. That'll, that'll be pleasing to many, I'm sure. Um, thank you, Vasily. We've uh, started to get some questions coming through now. So um, just, just moving on, probably a, uh, a question for you, Hans. Um, will requirements uh, requests for up-to-date buyer accounts um, be relaxed following the uh, HMG scheme, uh, HM government scheme withdrawal? Do you think there'll be less of a need for that um, going forward? The <clears throat> Currently, this is a temporary measure uh, with regards to the filing requirements in companies' house and the filing deadlines that fall beyond the 6th of April will fall under the normal rules again of the six or nine months, depending on the business. So, no, uh, this is not going to be a permanent change. This is a temporary measure purely to assist businesses to give them some flexibility during the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. And given uh, companies' house, uh, is still still isn't checking um, uh, KYC of new business startups, um, and the number of frauds coming through. Um, you know, do you, do you think there's going to be a sort of a propensity for for more fraud? I think um, I don't think actually companies' houses isn't so much to blame for it. Companies' house is to, is is merely but a filing archive. Um, I think the government scheme has done a great amount to uh, to allow people to set up with very little checks being taken for loans to be extended. These loans are all guaranteed by the government. Uh, the banks have done very little checks behind these loans. There is talk of multiple, I mean, 20 plus billion that is uh, potentially going to be written off and will be footed by, um, by us as taxpayers or fraudulent loans that have been taken out. So... Um, it's difficult. Uh, a lot of these companies, a lot of these new businesses don't yet have to file anything. They just have to file their basic information, but there is no accounts. There is nothing further uh, that, that you that you will find on companies' house or anywhere else. So we tend to do quite a lot of background searches into the directors and see what the directors, where have they come from. Uh, we're looking at SIC codes. I mean, uh, are these SIC codes in relation to the business trading name, for example? So there are various ways in which we do keep an eye out to make sure that these businesses are uh, not trading fraudulently. However, uh, as mentioned, the data is its lack of data, which is the biggest issue at the moment. And then you've also got misleading information. Uh, and thank you, Hans. Just a bit of a follow-up as well, a um, uh, question coming through on that. Um, so whilst companies have been given the extension, do you see any uh, appetite that they take it up? So, i.e., have we seen more accounts being delayed in filing? You know, did you get a feel proportion? Proportion we, we are seeing businesses that are changing their filing date even by one day. Changing that by one day means a three-month delay. 
we are seeing that it is happening. Generally, we tend to treat that with a lack of, with, with some suspicion. Um, why would you want to do that? We also have to consider that what was currently being filed is 2019 or early 2020 accounts. So these will be accounts filed pre-coronavirus. Why are they being delayed? Um, is this a sign that they're already starting to hide information in the background? Um, next year, we'll start to see the accounts coming through on the trading period during coronavirus. Those will be interesting. And then the following year, we'll see how businesses trade out of coronavirus and starting to get back to normality. We're still in a period for the next two years, which is going to be extremely gray and information is going to be absolutely vital. Um, that's going to be the trick for, for us in the next couple of years, even. Thank you. Um, question for um, the, the, the silly. Um, with jobs now, uh, certainly in the start, we didn't really touch too much on the financial services sector or, or even at all, really. But, but ultimately, with a lot of jobs sort of shifting to continental Europe now, um, it's not the EU's priority to, to stop the outflow from the UK, obviously, probably far from it. Um, so obviously banks and other financial institutions, you know, have, have set their hopes up on the equivalence process. Um, uh, but that's a weakened substitute for passporting rights. Um, but, you know, with, with the divergence from the EU, we, we see some sort of uh, support coming for, you know, amongst hedge funds, for example, uh, and the insurance industry itself. Um, so, you know, whilst banks are active in Europe, um, ultimately, hedge funds get a lot of their capital from uh, Asia, etc. So they're not really particularly reliant on the on the on the EU per se. Uh, have you seen any sort of you know, evidence of that? You do you see the financial sector, you know, really uh, shifting from 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 UK to to EU? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. First of all, I'm not a financial services lawyer, so I'm not in the receiving end of a lot of uh, such instructions. Uh, and um, I don't have a, a structured view as a professional on this. Um, as a general comment, though, uh, I don't think that the EU is favoring or disfavoring uh, uh, such, such a shift of resources, let's let's put it this way, from, from the UK to the EU. Um, how shall I say? It's a free market. Um, if uh, some UK interests uh, want to move to the EU, uh, I'm sure they will do their job uh, in selecting whether they're going to go to Germany or to France or to the Netherlands and Amsterdam uh, or what have you. Um, there is no central government in the EU. The Commission does not play the role of a government, really. It's, it's a normative body, uh, it's a regulatory body, but ultimately decisions are taken uh, at, at government level. So I don't think there's such an agenda, either in favoring or disfavoring such moves. Um, I do think that, uh, to, to, to a certain extent, there's also insecurity and uh, doubts as to how the situation will evolve. For some operators, it may be simpler to go, okay, to say, let's pack up and go to Amsterdam. Uh, it's across the channel. Um, they have infrastructure, they have convenient legislation. It's a big center. So let's move there, right? Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't have a more sophisticated view of this. No, th th thank you, Vasily. Um, also, um, just, just another one coming through on, on Brexit. And this is probably a question maybe for, for you, John, or, or Vasily, um, in respect to the freight movements, obviously across the channel, um, you know, pretty much uh, going on a cliff edge, uh, ultimately. Um, do you think uh, medium-sized businesses are, are looking to perhaps, you know, not um, uh, not export uh, into the EU and, and they just find other markets? I mean, particularly perhaps connected to that, um, there was an ONS survey end of January that did sort of suggest that 50% of businesses uh, in the UK were actually moving and shifting their supply chains to within the UK. So, you know, already finding alternatives. Um, so again, you know, do we think that's a short term thing or, you know, really to just get over the, the headaches of the Brexit transition? Or is it, is it, do you think it's something that could actually persist? Um, well, from from my from from my side, Andrew, I think um, 
a lot depends on the sector as as we've uh, as Vasily and myself sort of mentioned you know on the food and beverages side there's been a, a very sharp uh, fall in the level of exports now of course as, as uh, Vasily rightly points out that could be just that immediate sort of uh, uh, month after transition where we had the pandemic uh, you know sort of um, uh, sort of spiking up and uh, a number of the factors people adjusting to the uh, the new uh, sort of customs measures but at the same time you're talking about you know, perishable goods so even if it improves you know quite a bit from sort of January the chart there's, there's still a strong likelihood that uh, a lot of businesses and um, for example um, you know the seafood um, sort of seafood uh, exporters they've now they've um, uh, I think I was reading about um, you know, the the, uh, uh, the the Cornish fishermen where now they, they've found new domestic markets there's a big sort of uh, increase in demand for some of the the shellfish uh, you know the scallops and uh, other types of things which were at something like eight 85% were going into France and other parts of the continent and now um, you know now founding new new domestic homes so I think yeah I mean I think that it really will depend on how uh, how things settle down to some to some extent thank you John. indeed if I may add just a sentence here uh, sure. fully, fully agree John um, and um, I think it's likely to see a phenomenon where for in particular for SMEs where the the provisional uh, may turn into permanent, like shifting um, to different customers, different suppliers, uh, that may become permanent going forward if, um, if it works. Um, it's different, of course, for large corporations. Um, they're getting prepared in a very different way. They have the means to perhaps support financially such changes. Um, um, and maintain uh, traditional uh, traditional trade flows. But SMEs, I, I think that we're going to see a lot of them shifting uh, to, to, to alternative uh, trade routes. Thank you. Uh, and, and also just, just on the theme of sectors and supply chains, um, there seems to be, you know, a shift of, you know, moving away from the traditional routes of the short crossing. So we've obviously got um, the Irish corridor, corridor etc with uh, you know ships now sort of navigating their way you know rather uh, you know sort of around the UK and rather than you know not uh, using the Irish corridor itself so you know do you, I, I'm guessing that you know companies now are you know finding other ways uh, and other routes essentially to negate some of the frustrations on the, um, you know on the borders um. The situation with I mean, the, this, this situation with Northern Ireland, uh, UK, and the EU is not um, well. We all know it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, it's a uh, it's a quite awkward uh, um, hybrid uh, between having or not having a border. Right? And that was, I mean, that's a political decision. Um, I personally think it's it's going to give rise to all sorts of issues. Um, I'll give you a very, uh, a very quick one. Uh, like when you claim duty drawback, right? When you have paid excise duty on an imported input, and then when you export the finished good, you ask for the uh, uh, for the excise duty to be to be refunded. Um, when you move uh, under the TCA, when you move goods from the UK to Northern Ireland through the EU, you can request duty drawback upon exportation of your goods to the EU. And then subsequently, these goods will go to, the, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, but when you move from Northern Ireland to the UK, via the EU, you cannot. So um, I'm just giving you one example. Um, I think, and also, uh, where is actually the border? Where will it be uh, in, in five or 10 years time? Um, is this situation with Northern Ireland now a permanent thing? If it is, one would expect to see a border one day, uh, 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 you know, in, in Ireland between the Republic uh, uh, and, and Northern Ireland. Um, will this hybrid uh, um, example uh, uh, survive? Uh, perhaps it will. Perhaps it won't. Uh, if it doesn't, is is a border on the island uh, at all acceptable? Um, these are open questions, I think. Indeed. Thank you, Vasily. And um, 
we don't have any other questions coming through. I'm just conscious uh, eight minutes now to run to the end of the session. Um, if you do have any questions, um, uh, please feel free to, to let us know as soon as possible. Um, Hans, just one question in respect to information and information gathering. Obviously, within COFAS, you know, we, we invest a lot in information. Um, and you were talking us through some of the uh, challenges and the impacts uh, of, of gathering that information and, and the information assessment. Does that sort of go across border? So COFAS, uh, obviously international, we're an international business. Um, you know, do you see the same happening elsewhere? That you know we're having to you know think on our feet in respect to you know getting different data, more information you know with the absence of financials um, and being more creative. Do do you see that uh, happening across COFAS? It's it's irrelevant and and maybe irrespective to coronavirus, but it's a it's a never ending challenge across the whole of COFAS is data gathering. Data is is gold uh, and it's getting hold of that data. We're all across many countries and regions around the world working with more or less yesterday's information, information that is made publicly available so many months, six months, nine months, 12 months after the event. And in some cases, it's information, for example, in the US that is just not that readily available. Um, that is where COFAS actually has additional uh, powers where it seeks to, to, to find this information by having interviews with the, the businesses themselves and looking at various other sources. Um, in the UK, for example, I'm looking at information, what I call tomorrow's information, information that is happening now, but will have an impact tomorrow on particular financials of a business. So we are all constantly sharing with each other, not just in region, but across the globe as well. Uh, through the regions, we share on our methods and how we gather this information so that we can all strengthen our own individual portfolios and requirements. So, yes, it is, uh, it's is—it's not just coronavirus driven, although there is some speed and some urgency now required as a result of coronavirus. It is a never ending search uh, as part of COFAS, and it's also a never ending request from our clients for information. And let's not forget that they are also the ones looking for this information through us, and we make it available to them through uh, through various platforms. Thank you. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, one of the things that I've observed over the last 12 months is that, like you say, our clients um, particularly are more interested and our partners are very much interested in beyond those that we immediately deal with. You know, that's, you know, those in the supply chain as well. I think it's mm -hmm. never been a, a more important time to sort of, you know, be looking at the supply chain and who, you know, you, you're at risk from. So, mm -hmm. you know, within supply chains, disruption at borders, um, you know, uh, the, the, the lack of supply of raw materials, um, you know, the change in FX rates, you know, all of these things I think we've seen ever since the Brexit referendum, you know, we, we've seen, you know, uh, you know, one shift uh, uh, or another, and obviously with the pandem pandemic, it's pretty much sort of propelled us, you know, more forward into that, you know, needing to be more creative and more aware, um, you know, from a from a 360 perspective. Um, well, well, thank you, Hans. Um, there are, um, oh, yes, I have one other um, uh, question coming through. Um, the Suez Canal. So the uh, the ship that uh, has blocked the uh, Suez Canal for a um, for for a few days. Uh, do we think there'll be any implications to the supply chain? I mean, I'm guessing most probably there will be because there were 300 odd ships queued up behind it. So I'm I'm sure that will delay um, particularly. But uh, anyone want to take up that question? Well, I was reading today in various reports that. Um... Uh, the, the 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 ports are bracing for uh, bottlenecks, and what uh, what they didn't receive uh, for a week uh, is likely to flood them in the next days. But um, but I don't think it's going to have uh, any more serious implications. I mean, they managed to unblock it relatively quickly. Um, initially, the fear was that it would be stuck there for much longer, which would be a problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, the main issue now will be bottlenecks uh, at, at, at ports for, for the next couple of weeks. 
so to a degree of indigestion, I should imagine, uh, from, from that. Um, and then just one uh, last question before uh, I summarise and wrap up. So given the huge liquidity pumped into UK businesses with all the COVID support schemes, have you uh, or has COFAS uh, reassessed uh, the insolvency projections that, that these won't spike um, until you know Q4 or Q1? Again, I think that's a bit of a sort of a crystal ball, but maybe that's one for you, John Hans. Um, do, you have, do you have any view on that? Yeah, I can take that. Um, I mean, the, the, this is where I've come from with misleading information. There's a vast amount of money being pumped into businesses with very little outgoings. The question is, uh, when do they have to start to repay this and how are they going to repay this? Furloughs are going to be ending. Will trade pick up at the same time? To what extent will trade pick up? Uh, to what extent will it pick up enabling them to repay? Then there is also the hidden factors that these payments can be delayed. They can be paid over 10 years. So there is there's some relief being offered there. Um, but then you've got the question, how many people have uh, used that money wisely and not uh, spend it um, on, on potentially fraudulent transactions? Because there's a big issue there as well. Uh, the government has done a, a big job in supporting businesses and to keep them afloat. But somewhere along the line, that bill is going to have to be paid how do we assess that? We look at the liquidity of these businesses, but it's all going to be crystal ball gazing at the moment, and, and hence the, the requirement to look for more data. Indeed, thank you. Okay, so we've come to the end uh, of our session. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. Just to summarise, I think it's fair to say that you know we have adapted uh, to the landscape. It continues to be challenging, and we continue to evolve. Um, and try and, you know, as best to anticipate uh, what we can uh, ultimately. So, um, you know, we're working very hard at COFAS, um, you know, day in, day out in order to uh, deliver, um, you know, good information, good decisions, uh, essentially, that you can take comfort from. Uh, and thank you, Vasily, um, particularly for your, your view on Brexit. It's clear that, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a long tail to this. It's not over. There's going to be some nationalism, I'm sure, that we're going to continue to see with, um, you know, people uh, holding perhaps vaccines to ransom, um, as we've reported in the news. So I think it's fair to say there's going to be a lot of turbulence continued, um, you know, for, for, for months to come. Um, but hopefully we will sort of get into some kind of rhythm uh, in the future. But, you know, having the insight of, you know, the, the deeper insight into, you know, point of origin, I think is fascinating. Uh, uh, particularly if you are manufacturing, you know, that, that you know, obviously is quite complex. So thank you very much, um, everyone, uh, for your time and giving up your time. And um, uh, obviously, we'll look to uh, host another session uh, with some more interesting topics uh, in, the, in the next few months. And uh, I wish you a good day and a very good week. And thank you very much for joining us. If you have any further questions, you know, post uh, the meeting please send them through and um, I'm sure we can get back to answer you. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.